Honey, I blew up the business. Welcome to the podcast. Very excited today to have Emily come in with us. Nice to see you, Emily. Nice to see you too. Excited to be here. I'm excited to be here because Emily's a really exciting entrepreneur with a great story. And um, I'm really excited to get into it and share it with everybody today. She's the founder and CEO of a, a company called Untangle. And Untangle is a startup that creates technology that makes grief less lonely and overwhelming. And I want to get into this. What you've, I think, called death tech. Is that right? Death tech. It's a strange term that's emerged um, out of this space of people trying to make death or grief a little bit easier and better for people. And uh, yeah, it's a funny one, though. I think when you hear death tech, you kind of wince a bit and think, oh, <laughs> it doesn't quite land. Yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's fascinating. It's interesting because, of course, this is the thing that we do like to pretend isn't going to happen to us, but of course is going to happen to everybody and is a, an important part of life. And this idea of, well, I think you call it grief tech, perhaps, is a bit mm. softer. But th this um, the, uh, Emily's startup launched in April 2020 but has been extremely um, fast growing with a user base of, I think, over 12,500 people now. 14,000 actually since we last Is it spoke. Really? Okay. Wow. Okay. It's 14,000 active users and, uh, and, and has over 60,000 followers on Instagram, which um, is a lot in a couple of years. And I think shows the amount of kind of interest in, in the topic. But the, the reason I wanted to speak with Emily is, is she's got a very interesting origin story for this product. And, and, and it actually it resonates with a lot of the themes that we end up exploring in this podcast. Of, 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 uh, obviously, it's within the context of business, but we're all humans and we have different health issues and, and relationship issues and things that happen in, in our lives that uh, impact us as, as entrepreneurs. And um, and for full disclosure, we, we met actually through uh, a mutual contact friend, a, a, a lady called Liv Sibony, who is also a podcast guest. And uh, my company, the tech department, is, is talking with uh, uh, with Emily's company about potentially partnering. But I, I was very keen to bring you on the podcast. And it, that reminds me, this podcast is brought to you by my company, the tech department, which is the one I blew up back in 2017 and made a mess of it. But we turned it around and we kept it going and it's, it's, it's going to doing really well now. Thank you. So if you like what we're doing here, we're trying to help entrepreneurs like you, like me, like Emily, not do the thing I did in 2017 and blow my business up by messing it up. So we're trying not to do that. So the whole point of today is to dig into life lessons so you can run your business better, you build your startup and, and grow. And so if you like that mission and you want to help other entrepreneurs, please give us a review on Apple Podcasts because that helps us with the algorithm and all that stuff. And we're trying to help entrepreneurs. So um, do a good thing. Give us a review, a five-star review, of course. Don't cheapskate me with a one star. Anyway, yeah, well, let's get into it. I, I want to go back actually in time to 2018. I think you've been um, uh, out of university for a couple of years and um, you, you were working in a big company, uh, Kingfisher PLC, I believe. And then you, but the, whilst you were working there, you had this kind of family, um, uh, you, you faced issues in your family. And can you just, I mean, if you don't mind taking this back to that point, you sort of, so you're starting your career and you're just sort of, and then this sort of family or thing blows up. Yeah, I'd been, um, so yeah, I've been out of university a few years, done various jobs. I'd been at um, a insure tech startup and then I went to Kingfisher. Um, I thought, you know, go to a big corporate, learn, learn best practice from a corporate environment. And um, I was there and kind of whilst I was there in the background, what basically happened was my grandpa, who I was very close to, um, my grandpa Harold on my mum's side, died. Um, and literally around the same time, my parents got divorced. And I was kind of, you know, like, it's just all these big things happened all at once. And I was supporting my mum, trying to work out you know, you just don't, you, until you've gone through these things, you don't really know what to do. And like, there I was, my mom's having a very difficult time and I'm basically trying to work out how to help her and um, found it incredibly overwhelming, very confusing going on Google. Like there's so much information and you're like, well, what applies to us? And do we need to pay inheritance tax right away? And do we need to close this account? And um, how do we plan the funeral? And who do we speak to? And and he died at home. So like, what do you do with the body? <laughs> like, you know, there's so many questions. Um, and the same with the divorce as well. Like I was helping them and both my parents and, and you kind of just think, and like, and I was, 
as someone kind of supporting everyone around me, found it very, very isolating and difficult and was kind of looking online for support um, and really struggled. Like there are Facebook groups, but they just, they're full of people being like, you know, come join my religion or like, hey, like, let me whisk you away. Um, like potentially vulnerable person here. Um, and it just occurred to me that like, there's just such a need for support at this time. That was, that's, I look back in hindsight and I'm like, oh yeah, that was the beginning of the idea from Untangle. But at the time I was just like, whoa, I need some help and I don't know where to find it. Um, and, and yeah, it was, it was tough. And, and I think it's interesting as well, because you have your, you know, you go into work and I'm ambitious in terms of my career and you want to be professional and strive and, and work well. And then you've got all this background noise at home and you're, I'm trying to help and, you know, trying to call up people during the work day. And I think that that was also very difficult to be kind of managing something very challenging and traumatic at the same time as, you know, trying to strive and, and build in my career. Wow. Okay. So, so you've it's like a real moment in time, I guess. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, things obviously been building up to that point. Like my grandpa had been like, he kept threatening to die for about 10 years um, before then. Um, so we knew it was going to happen, but even so, like when it happens, that's a very different thing. You're suddenly thrust in this whole new world. And, and same with my, my parents. I hope they wouldn't kill me for saying it, but like, you know, I could have told them 10 years before they got divorced. They probably should have. So in a way it was like this big moment that had been building up and building up, but actually it didn't make it any easier when it came around. Okay. So you've sort of been, so you've kind of left university and you're out in the big world with your ambition, call it. And you're in, you've had some experience in a startup and you've, you, I know you were a very entrepreneurial person and, 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 and you've had a lot of kind of stuff before Kingfisher, you, you, you know, doing stuff and, and, and very kind of creative. And then you're at this big company doing things properly and trying to, you know, do, you know, tick all the boxes that you need to do for your future career. And then the, 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 this kind of, so you're at the start of it, of it all, is my point. And then this thing kind of happens. So what was your, what was going, what was, how are you feeling in that moment? You know, when you're sort of confronted with what you thought was this new path that's opened up and now it's all starting to kind of, um, all the emotional sort of impact of that and how it's going to imp imp impact on you. I mean, I'm probably the queen of like <laughs> just coping, um, which is not the healthiest thing in the world. And I'm definitely trying to get better at like, feeling my feelings and you know letting the emotions come out but um I went into kind of overdrive like right I'm gonna fix everything I'm gonna sort everything I'm gonna get everything helped um and like I remember when we moved out of like the family home for example and my my mum was uh she was away that week I don't know how that happened and like I remember being with a headlamp cutting down like all the hanging lamps in our house with my sister on google thinking and like then I'd go into the office the next day um and we were boxing everything up but it was it was like absurd in a way it was just it was like an absurd time that I was just doing these things and kind of going through the motions and I think it's only been as you know, it's not lost on me that I then set up this business as a way of processing and dealing with a lot of what happened. Um, and it's only been with time and space that I think the, like the, the feelings of kind of my sadness have come through at that time. I was very much like, go, 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 cope, 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 uh, cope. Um, <laughs> and just trying to keep it together. Um, but I was very stressed and, and quite overwhelmed. So you're in this sort of hyper reaction to the circumstances yeah. and you're in this um, job. And so what happened? So you, you left King Fisher to go to move on. And so, so what happened? Uh, what was the next move in your career? So I was looking to do something um, with some purpose. And I obviously had this experience and I thought this is so difficult. Um, I want to make it easier for other people like this. We're all going to go through a big life event, whether it's death or a divorce or an illness, like something difficult. And there should be a place to go and get support. We should be talking about these things, not just when they're in kind of a crisis and, and they're happening to us. Um, so I had that and I came across Zinc, who are a tech for good business incubator. Um, and I basically 
I actually started working for them um, on what they were kind of halfway through one of their programs. So I was working with a couple of the startups, um, quite a few of the health tech startups in, in that uh, cohort. And, but I knew that I wanted to do this business myself. And then the following um, kind of program started and I began exploring what will now, you know, what is now Untangle. Um, but it was, it was quite interesting as well, going from quite a structured work environment to something where I was essentially consulting quite a few businesses, setting my own agenda, working in, you know, setting my own structure. And actually when you've got a lot of kind of crazy stuff going on, at home and you know things are stressful then having to create routine and work was a real adjustment um and and that was quite an interesting leap into um a different way of working and I think it it made me kind of have to step back and look at my the way I work and what was going on in my life and say right like what's the best way of kind of coping and managing here so on that theme then so do you find that you'd had the the, the the family the the, the bereavement the, the divorce and you got this structured environment then you're in this unstructured environment so you feel like that looking back on it now do you feel that was a kind of period of where you were having to kind of learn this kind of all center yourself more and be, learn some more kind of self sufficiency perhaps yeah I mean to be fair I've probably always been um, my family's always been a bit chaotic through my life. Um, there's lots of things I probably won't go into, but um, so to some extent I have had to create structure. um, But I think very much at this point, like there was, you know, that when I was younger, I was at school or was at university, there was some level of structure, but I was having to create um, routine and, and like mental health became really important. So things like exercise, I know are good for me and make me feel good, but I, remember at the time I, I lived in Whitechapel and we were about, I don't know, 15 minute run away from the Thames path. And I'd go, when I look back now, I'm like, what the hell? I wouldn't do that now. But in my early twenties, running at like 11 PM down the Thames path at night, which was empty and it was like beautiful and peaceful and so dangerous in a way. Um, but I just kind of, anyway, I, fa- I found slightly more healthy <laughs> and structured ways of coping, but uh, I definitely had to develop um, my toolbox, if you like, for being resilient. And um, and I, that's something I still use today in the sense of like, you know, I can identify when I feel a bit overwhelmed. I know that I need to take myself off, go for a walk, do some exercise. You know, I understand now like when, I need structure and also when I need to have fun and stop and play and um but it took me a while and I think at that point I was kind of recalibrating what I knew and what I needed. So so you're in this in you're in zinc, you're kind of working with these different startups, you're kind of learning some you're building your toolbox, and I might come back to that um theme, the resilience toolbox. I think it's quite a nice sort of uh, analogy. Um and then but you've had this the family experience, you've had the seed of the idea, perhaps, which is forming in your mind. And what was it forming in your mind then? So was that in your head? No, it definitely was. So I was, I basically, um, I think, because I've been doing business strategy, so that would generally be in my, my kind of professional roles before via quite a few different routes. But um, so one of the big things is when people are looking, you know, they know they have a problem and they're looking for a solution, that's probably a good place to start when you're developing a new product. And this, and so I was like, well, people have a bereavement, you know, they go online, they look for help exactly as I did. There's a hundred thousand monthly searches for what do I do when someone dies? Um, I didn't know that stat at the time, but I started to look into it. And I was like, you've got this captive moment where people are looking for help. And, um, and then you look at, you know, all the things that someone has to do. So I started exploring it and I was like, well, when you have these big life events, um, there's lots and lots of practical things you have to do. You make big financial decisions, legal decisions. So I was like, well, there's a commercial opportunity there as well. So so I was stewing it. Um, but when I first started Zinc the, at the beginning of the program, I actually did that thing where I was like, I'm not going to get ru- like run away with my idea. Just because I've had this experience doesn't mean that it's a great idea. So I basically interviewed about 50 people, which was too many in hindsight, um, <laughs> but hey-ho, about the three most challenging things that had happened to them, um, bar having children as an adult. And pretty much like 
at all of the data that I gathered echoed my experiences and um so I started to validate this and that's that's when I really started working on it as a business I was like there's an opportunity here so how so that was how long after you were a zinc for how long and before before you sort of launched the uh, untangle I was there for six months working with some of the businesses and then um then I started untangle okay great. so why was 50 too too many because basically when you start to see patterns, I think they say eight. If you interview eight people and you see a pattern, then you can stop. <laughs> um, there was, by the time, like I, by, I started to see patterns really early on. Um, and actually I probably could have stopped at 20 very comfortably. Um, okay, so you've got, you've, it's in the pattern. You, it's, it's, it's sort of validating it based on your own experience, I guess. And you've got this kind of, uh, again, a, your personal story that's sort of beneath it. So what happened What happened then? How did you, how did you launch the business? Um, so I started that and then basically went and mapped all of this in research, then looked at the market, what was on offer. We spoke to a bunch of founders. Um, there weren't really that many, but a few in the space. I remember speaking to Dan at Farewell um, and... Uh, a few other founders and looked at the market and basically mapped out, you know, what is it that people are currently doing? Where are the big needs? Um, and realized that the two things that kept coming to the top were people feel very isolated. Even if you've got amazing friends and family around you, um, you, your experience is different to, you know, your family members experience of the same bereavement because you've got a different relationship to them. And so actually people are often looking for others that have lost someone that has the same relationship or in the same way to them that aren't within their friends and family. And the other thing is you don't really want to burden the people around you. You don't want to worry them if you're feeling really, really low. Um, so there was like something there about how do we help people connect with other people that have a similar experience. And then the other thing that kept coming out was like, it is so complicated. I had no idea what to do. And I was not in the headspace to figure it out and find out who, you know, which services I needed. Um, so I was like, well, we need some kind of like, what is this like grief concierge, you know, the roadmap for someone's grief that we can help them with all the, the admin they now call it sad men, but all the sad men. <laughs> um, and so it started off as a, I was a WhatsApp helpline and we set up WhatsApp support groups and matched people, went on Facebook, found people on Facebook groups, scooped them up. And for about, I think about six months after that, my WhatsApp picture was the very first Untangle logo. Um, and I was Emily at Untangle, which was quite annoying for all my friends, but... <laughs> Um, but that was how it started. Um, and we had, I think we started with 200 people and 90% of them wanted to stay past the first six week trial um, using the first iteration of the service. And I was like, okay, we're on to something here. Wow. So, and, and, and how, long was, how long did that take from your, from sort of setting up the WhatsApp group as the sort of first test? I don't know. Maybe it was like a, a few months. Um, it was also at the start of the pandemic. So time is completely warped. Um, and actually, that was really interesting, talking about curveballs. Like, so we've been looking into this, knew there was an opportunity, and suddenly the pandemic hit. So firstly, life just is thrown into disarray all over again. Um, and then that, then also there was this real sense of urgency, like, oh, my gosh, people are going to die. We're doing something to help people through this death experience. And... Therefore, I felt like a real sense of pressure. I like needed to get this off the ground as quickly as possible. Um, and that's pretty hard when it's like your first first time kind of really setting up a business and trying to work out what what to do. And and one of the big mistakes was trying to do everything all at once right from the outset. So um, we can talk about that more. more yeah, but. well, why don't we talk about it? It's cause, so you've got the six months at, at, at Zinc. You got this idea. You kind of start the whole thing, and then, and then, so, so, what, what was the, the kind of? You say you took on too much, or you're trying to do everything. So what, what was everything? What, you, what, what was the too much you were trying to do? So at that point, and to be fair, all of this stuff is stuff that 
we do want to do and are doing some of it now um, successfully. But essentially it was like, right, this has to be this one-stop shop where people can get help with absolutely everything. There's 170 things that people need to do on their bereavement journey from planning a funeral to closing accounts to working out inheritance tax to administering a state to packing up a loved one's house to, you know, memorial planning. There's like a lot of tasks and um I was like, okay, we, we've got to have solutions for every single one of these. And we've got, they've got to all be on like a big marketplace website. And there's going to be a community and loads of information that's really digestible and support groups. And it's all got to be there. And actually, the fundamental thing was we wanted to help people and want to help people navigate that journey. So having a website that has a thousand flashing buttons <laughs> with everything you possibly will ever need doesn't really solve the problem. The problem is, you know, the way that we're solving the problem now is basically gathering a lot of data so that we can personalize people's journeys. So you're not having to make lots of decisions. We guide you through that journey. But at the very first instance, I was like, right, we'll just put everything out there all at once. Um, And what you ended up having was a bit of a confusing proposition that, uh, you know, was everything was a bit shallow, like that we didn't have the depth across all of the the services. So in the end, um, and it took about six months really of like iterating that to realize actually let's pull back and focus on first community content. So people are getting the help and advice they need and the support they need make that really um, easy to use, you know, help people get them a place where they can ask questions and get answers and then we can start to like help them with that, their personal roadmap. Um, so we've, I wouldn't say we've pivoted, but we've had to like take a step back to go forward. So you've sort of simplified. Yeah, exactly. focus perhaps. All right, well, here's what I'm, I'm interested actually, is just to, there's a, so there's this period of time from, so I call it launching the business or, or committing to do it perhaps. And then, so how long after sort of committing and doing it and then to the pandemic was it? Was that, a, how, how long was that? So it was, well, we've, um, it was like January to March for those WhatsApp groups and the pandemic, that was when it came to the UK was that March. Okay. All right. So, so, so you've got the period of time. What I'm thinking is just for you personally, you. Yeah. Right? So, so you're this sort of, right, I'm going to do it. And, and it's all, so it's 2020, it's my time. I'm going to um, head off with my WhatsApp group. I'm going to, I'm going to do this. And suddenly March kicks off and everything gets thrown every, off or everybody gets thrown up in the air and you have this sense of perhaps, um, you said like kind of purpose and urgency, hmm. right? Which is um, a kind of, um, can be a bit of a kind of double-edged sword that for an entrepreneur, as I know. And and and, and then you've got the, so you've got the stress of the pan, of the business, right? You've got the stress of the pandemic. You've got, which is, you know, all stressful. You've got the stress of um, sort of the, the urgency you're feeling. You're a, you're a first time entrepreneur uh, with your thing that's rooted in a family story, which it feels very personal to you. So I, I imagine there's an emotional connection to the idea, which is perhaps, again, can be really good, but also can drive you very hard. So, so how were you feeling? This sort of, worry, March, April, May, <laughs> right? So you're trying to do everything all at once to serve the world at a time of need. Um, well, how are you feeling in that, that, uh, in that, at that moment? Yeah, one thing to add to that list as well was that so Zinc gave you us a bit of money to like live on. Um, if you could put for they've changed their model since, but the money was running out in that May, and uh, so basically I was like, I either need to get some kind of two day a week job so I can sustain and pay my rent, um, or we need to get some money for the business. So there was this other huge pressure. <laughs> coming oh yeah, so so the, the, the money's running out. So you, yeah. you're kind of you you so so you're it is so mu- three months after the pandemic it's like it, it's really it's really now beginning to get real. Yeah, it's crunch time. I was feeling it's really hard because time's just so warped when I look back, and I I feel like I've been in doing mode, like just do do do, um, and I'm sure at some point I'll probably be able to step out of it. And I have moments where I'm like, wow, this is an amazing thing we're doing. And I have moments where I'm like, am I allowed to swear? Yeah, fuck, <laughs> yeah. Like, fuck I'm so stressed. Um, and I think that that I just, sometimes it's pendulum between those. And at that time, 
I think I was, I, I think it was weird because in a way the pandemic created an opportunity to just focus on work and nothing else. Um, so like we, my boyfriend and I moved in with his mum. We hadn't even been together that long. So this was a whole new thing. I think I'd met her a handful of times and then we moved in with her because I was in a flat share and he was in a flat share and she had a bit of a garden. So it was, you know, oh my gosh. um, so there was this funny, and she, it was so, she was so lovely having us and it was, it was very kind of her, but there was this very strange few months where I'd kind of wake up, I'd work from like 7.30 to 7.30, then have dinner kind of, you know, in the early days of kind of getting to know her, you'd like sit at the dinner table and make kind of small talk and then go back and do a few hours and then like watch book TV and go to bed. And that was basically my life, like for this period. And it was very, um, yeah, I, I don't know. It was just, you just keep going, I think. That was, and then with the pandemic, we all adjusted. I mean, I, I felt like I adjusted, but it was very strange. You just create this new routine and this new structure. Um, and that's, yeah, I, I actually can't pinpoint how I felt at the time, but it was definitely a surreal period. So and what, what tools are you, are you, did you find yourself using out of your resilience toolbox? Funny you say that because I completely... I think because I'm kind of often in survival mode, <laughs> like it's just like the way I live my life. Weirdly, the pandemic completely threw me. Um, so I, I, up until that point, would walk to and from the office, which is like 40 minutes each way every day, and exercise like four times a week. Um, and then the pandemic hit and I just didn't exercise like for for about a year I didn't exercise and I hardly went for walks and actually I think I don't know what just happened it was like every everything that I'd done <laughs> in my toolkit just completely unraveled I have therapy um so I was doing therapy funnily enough I was going to stop doing therapy just at the start of the pandemic and then I said to my therapist I was like do you know what let's just carry on like there's a pandemic happening things have changed um but I actually found it really hard to do the thing, to motivate myself to do the things that I had found very helpful. And it's taken me a while to get back in. Like I now do exercise, you know, four times a week as I used to, or maybe more, but it's taken me a while to get back into it. Mm. So, so, so looking back now, what have you learned from that, or specifically that, that aspect of it, the kind of the toolkit that you weren't using like, what, what have you what, what have you learned from the absence of, of of those things i think what i actually learned which was part of a toolkit that i just didn't realize i had was that i had to just be kind to myself like and it was okay if i didn't you know wake up at 6 a.m and go for a run every morning and it was okay if i watch tv for a couple hours at the end of the day and it was it was okay to like just be um sometimes and I, I think that that's something I've always really struggled with that feeling of like and I think if you're you know a driven person you do you always feel like you're not enough like you're not working hard enough you're not a good enough friend you're not a good enough family member you're not supporting like there's always more you can be doing and I think I've kind of made my peace that probably my whole life I will feel that I could always be more and do more, whatever I'm doing. Um, but I, I think that that pandemic period forced me to like face up to that and just say, it's okay. You're all, you're just doing your best. And, you know, and I, I don't, I'm not great at like embodying that, but it's a good reminder. Um, so I, I think I added something to my toolkit, which was just to say, it's all right to just be and do what feels right. It's funny, I, I really very much relate to that. And I, I still have that sort of the need to do and be performing to feel self-validation. <laughs> You're like, uh, unless I'm sort of operating at a certain kind of frequency of productivity, I feel I'm like not really valid. And um, so but being aware of that is really important, actually, because the awareness is the first step, because if, when you're caught in those patterns and you're not aware of it, you're just driving yourself into a bloody burnout, you know? And um, so it's, it's, it's a really, I think, again, I've, I've been, um, something I've been more aware of is just sort of being with 
the feeling of perhaps uncomfortableness because of uncertainty and just not trying to run away from it or create activity to distract myself from from that you know the, the entrepreneurial ups and downs yeah i i mean i am definitely guilty of you know it's easy to talk about it on a podcast right <laughs> um but actually kind of saying it's okay like i th- i think one of the challenges I've, because you, you just need a laptop to work, you know, like I pretty much have my laptop with me all the time. I have it on the weekend. And yeah, to some extent you do have to work hard and long hours, but I I tend to have a lot of guilt when I'm not working. And I find that that's actually very unhelpful and um, means that I don't kind of rest properly. So I was I was literally having kind of a conversation with myself this weekend and I was like, it's okay to take Saturday and just not work and enjoy yeah, yeah, yeah. myself. But I have to I have to negotiate with myself. And so I, I that's something I'm really working on is is being a bit kinder and saying like stop this is a no no work time period. Like enjoy your time or work, but don't yeah, so what's really interesting though, that's I, I, I know exactly that feeling. And there's a couple of things that spring to mind. One is there's a, there's a chap who I've spoken about a lot on this podcast called Gabor Mate, Gabor, Dr. Gabor Mate. He's a, a Canadian or Hungarian uh, in his 70s uh, expert on addiction and, and parenting and ADHD and all various things. But he's a real guru. And he has a concept he calls compassionate inquiry. And, and what he talks about is, is like what, hap- what happens often when you have a conversation with yourself is you go, you ask yourself a question, but the, the question's in the form of an accusation. Why are you so bloody stupid? Why do you let, why do you, oh, you messed that up, you idiot. What are you thinking? Right. But, but, and you would never speak to a friend like that or a family member. You speak to yourself like, you know, you'd speak to, you know, like you were abusing an animal. You know what I mean? It's like, it, it, so he says, what, what, what you should do is perhaps uh, talk to yourself like you would talk to a friend and say, hey, buddy, you know, why, why is it you feel guilty when you're not working? What, what you know, why is that? Just, just think about that, Freddie. What, what do you think's in, uh, inside you that's making you feel that? And for me personally, me, that was, I found that really helpful, and specifically that point you raised of things that I'm kind of feeling these e- emotional reactions to, not absences of doing things or whatever. It's just actually sitting them and being kind and being like a good friend and putting my arm around myself. So, hey, why do you feel that? And then it's quite interesting what, <laughs> what comes out. <laughs> and and that, that process of learning, you know, therapeutic awareness of oneself some compassionate inquiry actually actually asking a genuine question of yourself like you would ask a friend i think it's quite helpful i have found to help me unpack some of those compulsive behaviors i like that compassionate inquiry i'm gonna i'm gonna compassionately inquire into myself <laughs> yeah I, 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 gabor mate i've got to tell you he's got he's amazing i'll, I'll dig out some links to his stuff because he's he's um brilliant on many many levels the other one that springs to mind is our, our, our first podcast guest is a chap called uh, dan sullivan who's a a, a a coach of entrepreneurs is the world's number one entrepreneurial an entrepreneurial coach but he has a concept um of the entrepreneurial time system where um basically you don't have time you have free days focus days and buffer days and because entrepreneurs are always working so basically he gets you to organize your time so you just you're on a free day you just don't work and and the reason is because you can't be creative when you're burnt out. But what everybody does as an entrepreneur is work, 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 burn out, take a couple of days holiday, but you, holiday, but you never actually replenish yourself back to 100%. And then you're always at the bottom of the battery. So, so as a kind of form of business strategy and commercial strategy is in, take a holiday. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Not. I should be working all the time because a broken Emily or a broken Dan doesn't help Dan's or Emily's business. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, it is. It is a funny one though because you're because funny enough, my coach does something a bit like that with me, where essentially you're framing rest as a form of productivity because it's helping you build up to being more creative or more effective in your job, and. I don't really know how to get around that because you haven't really broken down the issue that there's an innate need to feel productive always. Yeah, but yeah. yeah, it's it's a kind of it's a tool within that um, 
within the need to feel productive. Um, maybe, maybe it's something that I'll just always live with. To be fair, my mum always jokes that like, even when I was young, I would, there was always something I needed to do or get done. Like we'd be on holiday and there was always something, you know, some projects that I hadn't finished or <laughs> was still working on or something. So I think it's, it's probably a bit of an inherent nature thing. Yeah. yeah. And it's not, not, not wrong. It's just, it's interesting sometimes to reflect on these things and unpack the stuff that's working for you and stuff that isn't and, and where that line is, it, who knows, you know what I mean? It's an ongoing thing, but um, yeah, I think that's right. But then, but um, uh, yeah, like uh, I think new ideas and stuff comes from play, and you can do that only do that when you're rested and got to feel feel. Um, anyway, whatever. Where does um, where do we find more? Tell us about what's happening with Untangle now. Um, where are you in your in your sort of uh, journey now? What, what what's happening with you? So really where we're working towards is you kind of come to Untangle, you answer a few questions and we understand your exact needs, you know, wherever you are in your bereavement journey or your grief journey. And every, you know, day or week you get personalized help, um, whether that's, you know, here's an amazing funeral director that's going to help you plan your funeral and here's some tips for what to do. And uh, here's a support group that's for other people who've lost their partner to cancer. Um, And week by week, we essentially create this roadmap for your bereavement journey and your admin and all the finances and all the legal things you need to do. Um, Where we are in that journey is we now have uh, an app where we've got a community we have content, so video articles and very snappy articles, not like the stuff I was wading through <laughs> when I was going through uh, the experience. And we have a care team that you can chat to. Um, and basically what that means is if you are looking for some help or some advice, there's always someone there. You can you know can either talk to community members and say, has anyone else experienced this thing? I'm struggling with getting time of work or my employer's not helping me. Or you can chat to our team of experts and ask those questions and get help. Um, and in doing that, what we're doing is we're basically building up quite a deep understanding of our customers and of basically people's unique bereavement journeys. Um, and we're building a lot of trust. So we're becoming a place that people come to at this very vulnerable moment. They trust us um, and they're asking us these questions, um, which is which is great because with that kind of data and with that trust, we can then start to actually um, provide people with services along that journey as well. Um, and that's what we're starting at the moment. So we're starting to work with therapists and solicitors and financial advisors um, and yeah, we're kind of growing and growing and it's a very exciting time. Um, I think because we're, we're switching from this community and content model where to starting to actually monetize the business and like look at, you know, you're unlocking essentially a year and a half's worth of work um, and seeing is this yielding kind of commercial gains, if you like. And, and um, it is starting to, which is exciting. Wow, amazing! That's um, well, well that's just fantastic. And I, I think, um, where, where can we find you online? And um, well, if people are interested in in, in the app and, and and or connecting with you, um, you can find us at Untangle Grief across all our socials and uh, UntangleGrief dot com, our website, and we're also Untangle Grief in the App Store. Um, and the thing I should say, which is probably relevant for your audience, is we also support businesses uh, who who are experiencing um, bereavements in their workforce or employees that are having to grapple with this stuff um, has a huge impact on productivity and your emotional well-being um, when you go through something like this. So, um, and it's very uncomfortable for managers and employees if they don't know how to talk about bereavements in the workplace, which let's be honest, most of us don't. We don't even know how to talk about it with our friends. Um, so we do like training and consultancy and uh, we have an employee benefit package as well. So that's probably relevant. If anyone is looking for that, do get in touch as well. I think you should do. I think, it's, again, it's like as we started the conversation, this is an inevitability mm. in life and it will happen to us all. And um, so to actually have a, to build something really constructive and positive um out of the personal experience of of, 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 of death and to help 
uh, create a, something like as you're doing i think it's really uh, honorable and a good thing and a, of great use to to everyone so so check it out and and if you're run, uh, uh, running a business a lot of on- entrepreneurs listening to this um check that out and because you can look after your team and, and it's um, it's an important thing maybe useful for you too well it's one of those things that you never really forget how your employer treats you when your mom died or your partner died so it's really worth investing in and i think we're seeing this way of kind of femtech menopause fertility businesses where organizations are suddenly saying we should support our workforce at these moments and obviously i'm biased but i think actually something like bereavement um, or a divorce or a terminal diagnosis are just as impactful um, and there should be support around those events as well yeah, that's, that's really good. And I think this, this is about your, one's team uh, and in one's company is important to kind of look after that. And like you say, if you, th- these moments of crisis is when people remember that stuff. And, and that's kind of how you, again, without being sounding cynical, people are going to stick with you for the long term as, as, an, as an employee. And it's hard to find and retain good people. Then some investment in this kind of thing and, 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 and the culture that supports that is, is, in my humble opinion, really important. So well done. Keep it up. Great stuff. Check out. Everyone check her out. Thank and- you. And thanks for having me. It's been great. To- I feel like I've had a therapy session, actually. <laughs> no worries. I shall. Uh, yes, I shall. Uh, uh, well, well, please, I can be of service. <laughs> Yeah, send me an invoice afterwards. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. All right, see you next time, everyone. Do you want to get the top five tip bits from each episode emailed to your inbox every Friday? Yes, you do. It saves you having to go through and make notes and make a note of all the books and all the ideas that are in the podcast. We go through, we choose the top five we like, plus put all the links into that email. So if you just go up to honeyibluupthebusiness.com, Yes, that's honey, I blew up the business.com. And just enter your email address. There's a little box, just enter it in, and we will send you that information. And it saves you having to make notes and all that. That's uh, make your life a bit easier. And of course, if you did enjoy the episode, please consider subscribing. We are trying to help people through this. So the more people that subscribe, review, rate on Apple, Google, Podcasts, Spotify, the more people will see it and the more we can help. So help us help other people, other entrepreneurs like you. And before I go, I've got to say big up to my company, the tech department, the company we blew up and put back together again. They're generously supporting me on this mission through the podcast. So if you guys want to have a look at a company that can really help you improve your technology, make it better so your business gets better to boosting your sales and your profit and a bit more sanity in your life, a little less stress, then head up to the techdept.com, the tech department. Uh, my company... Uh, Give us a look. On behalf of all of us here, thank you for listening, and I'll see you next time.